0427 alpha was, was absolutely the most intense. The way that a college football team is operated is very militaristic. We start making contact with their, their lead guy and, and just asking for as much intel as, as we can get. I look down at, at the Brit and, and he's he's dead, man. I'm a PJ part-time man, like I could be serving my country full-time. He put me on that team to go knock a dude out, man. He put me on that team to go stick somebody and set the tone and do some damage to the other team. The caliber of individuals that pursue the SEAL teams, in my opinion, are generally gonna be a higher caliber that you see pursuing Air Force Special Warfare. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have a bunch of studs pursuing Air Force Special. That doesn't mean you're not going to have some Olympic athletes. Just the money that goes into it and the level of support, I mean, just the, the blessings, the, you know, the gifts that you're given as a football player. I mean, when I'm in the heat of battle, as long as I don't go unconscious, I'm staying in the fight. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. And so the the fourth mission, 0427 Alpha, um, I was sitting there watching Batman on, on my laptop. And you know, people would, would say, hey, when, when you get a, a big mission, it's it's going to be when you least expect it. Sure enough, man. I, I mean, I we had our, our walkie-talkie next to us, and, and whenever a mission would go down, you'd hear scramble, scramble, scramble on the walkie-talkie, and you know that's when your blood starts boiling, and you sprint out to the flight line. You got the helos there, your armor, your weapon, everything, your rucksack, everything's in the helo already because you staged it when you first came on shift. Intel runs out of the Intel department, gives you a nine-line Rotors are spinning up. You got limited uh, information on what you're flying into. And then boom, it's, it's go time. Um, so I was on the trail bird. Um, trail um, is, is the helo that, that lands on the mission. So our, our lead bird, we'd have one officer in there. Uh, PJ is, is an all-enlisted career field. Uh, but the Air Force has what's called combat rescue officers. So, so they're combat divers, halo jumpers. They wear maroon berets like we do. Uh, but they don't do the medicine. They're, they're strictly command and control. And so we'd have one young crow on the uh, the lead bird, two PJs. Uh, we have two gunners. Those guys are, are pretty high speed. They're, they're flight engineers as well. So they're not PJs. They're, their job is to be able to uh, to fix basic issues on the aircraft electronically and, and physically maintenance-wise uh, and then man those, uh, those 50 cows. Um, so each helo, you got pilot, co-pilot, two flight engineers, two PJs, and then the combat rescue officer on the lead bird. Same configuration on trail, except you got three PJs in there. And we all had different roles. So you have different roles when you're on the ground, and you have different roles when you're actually in the helo with a patient transporting them, trying to keep them alive. So I'm in there watching Batman, right? And, and like, I've got my headphones on, and I got my walkie-talkie next to me, and apparently we got scrambled. Which Batman? It was the the Dark Knight, man. All right. Yeah, yeah, the... the yeah. So, uh, so I, I guess my volume was turned up too loud. So I, I didn't, I didn't hear scramble. Oh shit! And I, I see uh, our team lead, um, Todd Popovic. He runs by uh, the little room that I'm in, and his eyes are, are really big, and he's running. So I'm just like, that seems a little weird. I'm going to pause this and, and check it out real quick, and, and then I get down the hallway, you know, and, and sure enough, yeah, I see other guys doing. I'm like, oh, we're scrambling right now. So I run out to the uh, the helo. And I'm putting on my armor, um, you know, checking out my, my kit real quick. Rotors are spinning up and Intel, Intel chick comes out with our little nine line, you know, so we got like coordinates of, of where we're going, uh, injury of, of our patients, um, what the, what the LZ is going to be marked by. And, and then the other information on that I probably shouldn't share, but on line six, uh, it tells you whether, whether or not you've got enemy in the area. So on line six, you got three options. You've got N, which is no enemy. You got P, which is possible enemy. And then you got E, which is enemy. And so I remember looking right there on line six, there's, there's enemy. And I'm like, dude, I'm, we're, we're about to do this. And so I had a, a different, this is only my fourth mission on, on Casivac platform, but I had a different feeling in my gut on this one. Like I, I knew it was about to go down. And so, uh, so we leave the, the wire and, um, you know, rack around, do a couple test shots, weapons working good, 50 cows are working good. And we get a little time call and, um, our, our 50 gunner, Trevor, He's like, hey, we got a sucking chest wound on this guy, sucking chest wound. So for our listeners out there, uh, if you get shot in the chest, you know, your pleural space uh, in, in your lungs, it's, um, it's completely decompressed, right? Um, 
So if for whatever reason you, you take a, a puncture to your lungs, uh, you're, you're now going to have compressed lungs and you're going to develop what's called a tension pneumothorax, which could kill you in, in 10 to 15 minutes. And so that's what a, a sucking chest wound will, will ultimately cause is a lack of ability to breathe. And, and so we got like 15 minutes roughly until this dude's going to be toast, unless the guys on the ground are able to administer basic self-aid body care. And typically your guys on the ground don't really know how to use occlusive dressings. They know how to do stuff like tourniquets, bandaging, uh, maybe even wound packing, you know, direct pressure, pressure point elevation type of stuff, but, the, but they're not going to understand how to search for an entry wound, exit wound, properly a place in occlusive dressing uh, and, and decompress the, the chest. It's just not going to happen. So uh, as, as we're getting there, you know, we, we'd already on, on the, the nine line, it said that it was just a gunshot wound to the shoulder. But then we got that update that it was a sucking chest wound. So at this point now, like we're trying to prep our, our medical gear on the bird. So as soon as we get this guy into the into the bird, like we've got all of the stuff prepped that, that he needs. So any trauma patient like this, that's got a lot of blood loss, we're going to give you blood. And in the back of this helo, we've got uh, packed whole red blood cells and we've got like this uh, configuration to, to do a blood transfusion. So with the packed whole red blood cells, you have this Y tubing and then you have a saline bag and then you have what's called an inflow, which, which warms it. And then the final piece, you have a three-way valve where you actually suck it into a 100cc syringe and then push it back into the patient. And the reason why you need the, the syringe at the end to, to push the blood in is because when you have a patient that's in shock, their veins are... are no wow. longer showing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're nothing, right? And so you got to go straight interosseous. That's into the bone marrow. And so we had like these easy drills. We go right into their humoral head and then you can immediately start administering uh, blood to them. So it we doesn't got, sound painful. Oh, it's got to be brutal, man. It's funny you, you brought that up, man. Like um, with with the guys I would get on the bird, I'd give them a cocktail of, of drugs. And, and, you know, fentanyl has such a bad name now, but, but at the time we were using fentanyl on the battlefield and nobody was even using it back in the States and fentanyl is measured in micrograms. So a little interesting piece of information for our listeners out there. The reason why you see so many fentanyl overdoses is because the drug is so highly concentrated. So the dose for fentanyl was 125 micrograms versus something like morphine. You're looking at four or five milligrams. Okay. So your, your room for error is almost nothing when it comes to fentanyl. If, if you give them too much, I mean, you, you could kill them right on the, the spot. Yeah. So I'd, Go ahead. I'd have a, I'd have fentanyl already pre-drawn in a syringe. I'd have it in my little kit and my little blowout bag as well as ketamine. And so when I administer pack whole red blood cells to a patient and I would, I would push that, uh, that blood in, it didn't matter if I had already given them fentanyl and ketamine and they were completely gone. They would wake up out of whatever trip they were on and, and scream in agony whenever fuck. I was pushing that blood. And you know, the docs would be like, don't worry, they they can't really feel it. I'm like, well, oh, that, doesn't make, yeah, that doesn't make sense to me. How are you gonna tell me they can't really feel it yeah. when they just went from tripping yeah. to screaming, looking me right in the eye, they can feel it, pal. Yeah. You know, so that was uh, probably the most painful thing uh, I, I would imagine any of these guys had to go through was, yeah. was getting blood, you know, pushed into their bone marrow. Jesus. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, man. man. Yeah, we, we'd go straight to the interosseous infusion whenever they were in wow. shock. Uh, you just didn't have a lot of time, right? Yeah. You had to keep these guys alive. And, yeah. and if we're getting called, it, it's bad, yeah. right? Well, yeah, I was curious. I mean, you guys come heavily loaded and, and even with uh, accompaniments. Uh, in certain cases, it, it, there has to be a, a tricky aspect of deconflicting with a QRF that's responding to the same thing. It, w was there ever any issues with that or, or, or did it go fairly smooth? No, if anything, we're going to work hand in hand or we're going to act as the quick reaction force for a time. But once we're done, once we get that patient out, like we're done, right? We're not going to stay on the ground yeah. and, and battle it out with you like a QRF would yeah. and then call it index. Like we're indexing when we leave the zone as soon as possible. So we'll bring some firepower and do some gun runs, suppress enemy fire for you. But that's so that we can evacuate your guy and, yeah. and, and then we're out. Yeah. Uh, and so is the escort. Yeah. So at the end of the day, man, like this, uh, back to 427 alpha, uh, that sucking chest wound, like we, we knew stuff was about to go down. So we're like prepping everything. And my job, uh, on this particular mission from the medical standpoint, uh, was to establish airway, uh, whether that it involved a, um, endotracheal tube, which is a pretty invasive procedure on the spot when you're in a helo or just getting them oxygen or whatever it may be. My, my, my job is, is airway at the time. 
And so I'm getting out all the airway stuff prepped and I finished that early. So I'm helping Mark out with the blood and getting the Y tubing set and all that. And we're getting pretty close to the zone. And, um, the, the smoke color that we're supposed to fly into is, is red. It, that's the color on the nine line, right? Cause we're flying into a freaking poppy field, man. And, um, Taliban was in the area and they actually tried to, um, ambush us and get us to fly into their smoke. So they deployed smoke to an alternate LZ about a half mile away, but the smoke was clear. And so they wanted us to try to go and, and land in the wrong LZ, right? But we're, we're not falling for that trick. Uh, that's why we, we, we have the, the color smoke marked at our landing. So I'm scanning, uh, we fly with our, our legs hanging out the doors. And so I'm looking out the door. That's one of the things I miss most about the job, man, is just flying around helicopters with your legs. You know what I mean, Mike? You miss that's those days, Hollywood dude. shit. I know it. All right. Hey guys, I want to take a, a second to talk about ads. Um, and this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that, um, you know, sometimes we get comments of, of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads or they're too long or what have you. And I, I want to clear two things up, which is number one is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and, and bring them in and, and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and, and what have you, this is how we, we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to, to be able to do it, uh, but we do still have to, uh, to pay bills and, and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with 100% accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use. Okay. That, that I either regularly use or always use or have used. And, and I refuse to budge on that. Okay. So we, we get uh, offers for, for sponsors regularly that, that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So Keep that in mind, uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads and, and realize that they're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what, what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Oh, no, but man. yeah, I mean, that there's, I don't think there's a guy that's done it that when you're, especially like the first time you're doing it where you're like looking out over the horizon, your legs are dangling in a helicopter. You're like, dude, I'm actually fucking doing this. I'm actually doing it. Yeah. It's cool. I mean, there's no, no two ways about it. It's fucking cool. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. I, I miss those days, but, yeah. uh, <clears throat> but we're legs hanging out the helo. You know, we got our little quick release, you know, Pelican hook right here. And, and, and you know, the, the carabiner is, is, uh, is latched to the D ring on the floorboard. So as soon as we hit the ground, like we've already got our hand on that, on that little quick release, boom, we're, we're gone. You know, we're, we're sprinting out of the helo. So, um, as, as we're landing, we, we see the red smoke and, and I'm on trail birds. So I'm landing lead birds doing spooky patterns overhead. So counterclockwise gun run pattern. Uh, we bring in the AH one, uh, the uh, attack helicopter, Marine Cobra and, um, myself and, and a PJ named Chaney Harrison, uh, were the two guys that they were going to get off the bird. The other PJ is going to stay on the bird and, and work comms. So we get off the bird and uh, we start running through this poppy field to try to make contact. And it turns out the guys that uh, we're going to, to pick up, these are like uh, British Royal Marines or something like that. They, they're Brits. And so uh, I'll never forget, man, because, you know, it, it, before you, you deploy, before you, you go to war you, you, on a shooting range, everyone's in line. Everything's all perfect, right? Well, all of a sudden there's rounds just coming out of nowhere, like right over my head and, and crossing paths with me. And I look over to my right and there's this Brit. And you could tell he's a Brit because of the, the way their helmets looked and he's wearing... Uh, multicam and he's firing directly over at our heads at the nine o'clock position. And so I just remember thinking, dude, that's odd. Like this guy is, is directly, you know, firing right in my direction, you know, but bullets are, you know, six feet over my head. And so he's lighting rounds down and 
and we get into the poppy field probably 20 yards away from the helo and we start taking fire from two different positions and so at this point i'm like well i don't really know where this is coming from this is all happening really fast and these these poppies are, are like four feet tall i don't really know what to do man like i don't know where where the brits are i just know this guy's up here i don't know what to do so i'm just gonna hang out take a knee and, and just drop here in, in this poppy field for a little bit and um the comms, there was so much comms going on that I couldn't really decipher what was happening. It was a bit overwhelming. And at that point, um, I, I got tunnel vision for the first time. So like my peripheral vision uh, was no more. It was like I was hyper-focused on what was directly in front of me. And so I didn't even realize it, but this Cobra had gone in for a gun run on our nine o'clock position uh, to suppress the enemy. And so right about the time that happened, Cheney, the PJ next to me, got up and started sprinting through the field. So I immediately like right on his ass, got up right when he did start sprinting right after Cheney. I'm like, all right, dude, like this guy's deployed before. I'm just going to do whatever he does, man. So Cheney and I are, are sprinting through this field and, and here's this compound over on the corner, all these trees lining it. And uh, here's the Brits that they, they come out of the, the compound and they've already got their guy on a litter. And so we get on over there and uh, we start making contact with their, their lead guy and, and just asking for as much intel as, as we can get. And I look down at, at the Brit and, and he's, he's dead, man. Like he's not only is, is he dead, like, you know, for those of you guys that have seen the, the Princess Bride, you know, they're in between mostly dead and all dead, right? I mean, this, this dude, like, you know, he's, he's, he's gone, Mike. So um, we, we escorted him across the, the poppy field. Um, our lead bird ended up doing a fixed forward gun run, which was, was very impressive. Um, AH1 swoops in in front of him, does another gun run. We're just hitting these guys heavy. And so we make it through the field and uh, we don't take a lot of fire uh, until we get back to the helo. And then they really start trying to dump on us one more time. Uh, we do another gun run on them. Uh, and then we start getting to work on our guy. So we load him up, close the door, and even though we knew he was dead, um, as PJs, no matter what, we give guys every chance that we can. It doesn't matter if, if they're dead. We're going to give you full CPR. We're going to give you epinephrine. We're going to do an ET tube on you, hook you up to oxygen, bag you, give you medications just as if you're alive. We'll put it in God's hands at that point. So we gave him everything that we had, man, and, and he, he was gone. So uh, we dropped him off to the dock and, uh, and, and, basically man like like that was that was the end of the mission and uh reflecting on this over time uh, i realized what what the brits did uh the brits knew they, they they had a soldier that was dead uh they worked our system and told us that he had a gunshot wound so that we would launch on it because if he was deceased we're not going to launch into a hot lz we're, we're going to wait till things cool down and then we'll go re recover but them knowing how we work in our protocols and how to get us to launch. I think they worked us a little bit, man. They, they said it was a, a gunshot wound to the right shoulder when I mean, it was really a gunshot wound to the chest, right in between his armor, kill, probably killed him instantly. And um, they gave us the updated call halfway there. And then of course, when we got there, he was a deceased patient. Uh, so we probably would have never flown into a mission that high risk to, to pick up a, you know, a body. But the gun runs bailed their ass out. But the gun runs bailed them out. And so that's why they ended up calling us yeah. is, is, hey, man, not only did they get some some suppression of enemy fire, but they also got their their guy off the battlefield. So, yeah. you know, it's a young PJ. I'll take the mission, man. But yeah. look, looking back on it as a business owner, you know, you got a lot of assets and a, a lot of valuable equipment, a lot of valuable personnel that are launching on a mission to recover, a, you know, a, a dead body. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think we would have done it if we would have got proper intel before yeah. the mission. That's, that's, inter that's an interesting take for sure. Um, did they not have normal QRF assets for that? Who knows what they had and what they didn't have in that area at the time. It was so kinetic that yeah. resources could have been limited. I mean, because I guess that was the root of my question of, of the deconfliction of a normal QRF versus what you guys are doing is that, you know, in a, in a generic scenario where a gun battle bursts out, somebody gets injured, but you know, like they're taking the fucking brunt of it and, and they're getting the, they're on the losing end of it is that if they get on the horn and say, Hey, you know, we're being fucking overrun. We need, you know, QRF assets. Also we have a, um, you know, let's say a, a sucking chest wound or, you know, an injured personnel that needs to be medevaced ASAP, Casavac ASAP is that at that point, like the commander, 
you know, the commander's intent or, or the commander in charge of the entire theater or that gig is going to say, okay, well, we, we need to send a QRF. We need to, you know, it would be a, a lot going on to, to decide, you know, who to send, do you send both of them? How do they communicate so that they're not, you know, landing on top of each other? I mean, that's a lot fucking going on that, that could go horribly wrong. There's so much going on. You know? And, and, you know, you have a lot of wisdom, you know, with, with your deployments over there, Mike, and you, you said it best. Um, a, quick, a quick reaction force is typically going to come in when you got problems, you're being overrun. Um, they weren't being overrun. They were taking effective fire. They were in yeah. a good little gun battle, but they were doing just fine. They had lost one of their brothers. So yeah. um, probably a good call for them, but yeah. but not such a, a good call for us. Yeah. I almost wonder if they requested QRF and they said, go fuck yourself. And they're like, oh, we got a guy that's down. I mean, who knows? You yeah. Know? That's, uh, wow, that's interesting. Um, so that was your first uh, taste into legit, like going into kicking the hornet's nest over on a two-way range and really getting getting after it. I am curious. I mean, I know, you know, you can do years of training of, you know, training on mannequins, dummies, fucking people that are faking it, you know, wh whatever. Was that the first live body in a combat environment that, that you actually worked on? Or was the other guy working on it since you and, and the other guy actually went and grabbed him? So, um, all three of us were, were working on him. And, and like I said earlier, I was working the airway. So, okay. Uh, I, I started CPR on him and then I gave him a, what's called an endotracheal tube. And this is a tube that you insert down into the trachea, use a laryngoscope to, to sight and, and get proper sighting of those vocal cords. And then you insert the tube down. It sits down. Uh, I believe it's called the carina, which is the junction of, uh, of your bronchioles into your chest. And, and you're pumping up, you know, both, both lungs on, on each side. Uh, with this with this tube, you know, you hook it up to a ventilator, or you know, we're not we don't have ventilator in an aircraft typically, so we're bagging them or or whatever it is. So I'm working the airway, uh, Cheney's working blood, um, and then the other guys more of taking documentation on on what treatments we're giving him, what drugs we're getting them, how we gave them the drugs, what time we gave them the drugs, what his uh, assessment is overall, letting the pilots know how much time we need, telling us how much time we have based on the pilots. So he'd be uh, doing more of, of lead duties and, and yeah. managerial duties. What, did you notice, I mean, was it different for you, like doing it for real instead of in a training and, and whatever environment was, was there a disparity there? Man, I, I got to say that, uh, that the Air Force Pararescue Program did an absolutely phenomenal job of preparing us for that. Um, you know, obviously, it's different in, in a real environment, right? But we had done clinical rotations in, in Tucson, Arizona uh, during the paramedic course where we got to see trauma and, and we got to, to, to work on life patients. So there was nothing that could truly prepare us for this, but, but I felt very well prepared yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. for that first patient. Yeah fascinating man but but not for not for the gun not for the gunfire yeah. I, I feel like that first mission was was the train the biggest training that i needed was to to kind of understand what that was really like instead yeah. of you know just shooting blanks at your instructors you know during yeah. land warfare while yeah. you're sleep deprived yeah yeah it's uh brings back a lot of memories um fascinating um what's the for the rest of that deployment, were there some other other missions that stand out as being uh, more more memorable and, and uh, impactful than others? Yeah, um, there was a, a mass casualty mission uh, that we went on, and, and you mentioned uh, earlier. You know, how do you understand which which entity to launch or which organization to use for this or that? You've got conflictions. Well, there was a, another casualty evacuation platform out there and they were call sign Tricky. We were call sign Guardian and Tricky flew on a CH-47. So they had more space and it was faster bird. Um, Tricky had a, a full on small sniper team. They had a doctor, they had nurses and medics all in their birds. So they were a great alternative to us. You know, it's a larger air platform. And they didn't have our rescue capabilities, but they were able to bring firepower into the zone and they had a lot of medical capabilities. So Tricky and Guardian both got launched at the same time. And the JPRC, Joint Personnel Recovery Center says, whoever, whichever one of you guys get to the zone first, like you guys are gonna be in charge of, of who carries out the, you know, the first load of, of, of patients. So it's a race. So it's a race. And so we're racing with Tricky because what happens is if you get in first, you're going to get the, the wounded patients. So number one, so you can get the, you can get the, the medical practice. And, and number two, like those are the guys that, that need to go first versus you get there second, you're going to pick up the, the bodies. 
And so um, it was a, a pretty kinetic mission. There were uh, two F-15s that just flied over. Uh, they didn't drop any ordnance, but they did a, a show of force. Uh, so there was a pretty big gun battle going on, not directly on the uh, insertion point, um, but uh, but just to the east of, of this location. And unfortunately, Tricky beat us to to the fight. And so when we got on the ground, it was all recoveries. And um, unfortunately, man, we had to put uh, five uh, deceased Brits in our, our aircraft. And um, before we, we, we got on alert, we actually um, would, each of us would have one American flag and one British flag, just in case we had to, to pick up one of our brothers, we, we'd wrap them in, in a flag. Um, so unfortunately, I had, to, I had to take my British flag out on that one, and, and each of us did, and we didn't even have enough flags because we had so many dead bodies in our aircraft. And uh, there's not a whole lot of room in the HA-60, especially when, when PJs bring all their gear in there. You know, we got a Mark 48, a mini hospital. We've got extrication equipment. Uh, we've got an enhanced battle rifle, mm. which is like a, a modified M14. So there's just not a lot of space. Uh, so on this mission, uh, I had to, to sit on top of dead bodies and, uh, and wrap them in flags. And, and it, it was, it was miserable, man. You know, it, it was, it, it was miserable just knowing that, you know, I had to, to sit on these guys and, uh, it felt like I was, I was disrespecting them, even though I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a choice, but it just, uh, it, it really brought to reality, um, what war is, you know, yeah. war it, it, to, to me before that was, was all about going in and, and, you know, saving lives and being a hero and, and gunslinging, but really war leads to, to death and destruction on both sides. And, and here I am with you know, five of my brothers, you know, yeah. below me and, and we're wrapping them in British flags. So uh, that was, that was a pretty memorable mission there. And, and then my last mission, um, it was very last flight, man. And we had, uh, we had just done a, a changeover with Alaska so I think this might have been an Alaska aircraft and their PJs were getting ready to relieve us and we were going to head home. And it was supposed to be just a, a standard fob pickup where we go in and pick up some dude who's, who's sick or, or wounded and, and the docs on their little fob can't take care of him. We got to take him back to big hospital. Um, like I said earlier, man, this is, this is Nadia Ali uh, River Valley, uh, Hellman River Valley area. There's opium everywhere. So any mission you go on, you never know, you know, some asshole is going to shoot at you, whether he's Taliban or, or whoever he is. So we, um, we picked up this guy in, in the Marines that were on the ground in that area. Uh, they set, set up what's called a, a DAR for us, a designated area of recovery. And this was like a cleared zone where we could fly into and fly out. They knew there was no enemy. They cleared it out. We're safe to fly low levels through this area. And as we were flying out, man, some dude started freaking shooting at us and he, he hit our helo and it came up under the floorboard. And one of these AK rounds came so close to my, my face that the best way I could describe it is I smelt the, I could smell the bullet. I could feel the heat and the energy from the bullet brushed by my face and it went up into the, uh, the comm box near, near the comm box. And that was just a big F you from, uh, from Afghanistan yeah. right before I went home, yeah. dude. So Jeez. almost got my freaking face shot off on my last mission. Uh, and then finally got to, uh, to head back to the States. Wow, dude, that's fucking, yeah, that's dicey. Um, in, in that entire, uh, the, you said there's 62 different missions that you went on. Yes. Um, of the stories that you've shared, uh, were there any other missions that you went on that gun battle wise were more intense? That zero four twenty seven alpha was was one. absolutely the most intense. Yeah, were, were there other ones or or any where you engaged anybody or actually, uh, you know, mixed it up, laid suppressing fire, and anything like that? As a PJ, there's going to be opportunities where you do have to suppress the enemy directly, but the primary thing we're going to do is call in CAS, yeah. and that's really what we're trained to do is be able to to find a safe place and and call in that air support so that we can move to our patient. Uh, if we're spending a lot of time on the ground exchanging rounds with the enemy, there, yeah. there's a problem there. Yeah. Did you did you call in CAS at any point? Uh, we did call in CAS yeah. on, on 0427. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, for the rest of those 62 missions, were they were they mostly transport type? Things? A lot of a lot of them were transports. Yes. Yeah. Any other hot zones that you landed in? There was a couple more hot zones. Is yeah. a, does one stand out as worth sharing? That one that, that I was telling you about the, uh, the casualty evacuation, yeah. uh, w with tricky, definitely. Yeah. And I guess any others that are worth sharing that, uh, you know, that were dynamic. No, man, that's, that's about it at this time. 
All right, so our sponsor, Masterworks, which is an art investing platform, now has 14 exits. Uh, exit is when the painting that you're invested in sells and you collect the profit. It's five exits in this year alone. Uh, it's exciting news for me personally as I do invest with Masterworks myself. Uh, most recently, there was a 17.6% net return on the last exit. Uh, every Masterworks sale to date has delivered a positive net return, 14 for 14. So, of course, as with any investment, there's no guarantee that the works for the works uh, yet to sell. Um, other recent returns include 10%, 13 and even 35% net. Uh, Masterworks enables you to invest in a painting without buying the whole thing, so you don't need millions of dollars to do so. Paintings are securitized through the SEC. Like I said, I'm also an investor. You don't need to be an art expert. That's their job. Masterworks already has tens of thousands of investors, over $800 million in assets under management. Uh, and you get special access when you use my code. Just go to masterworks.art slash mic drop to skip the wait list. Again, that's masterworks.art slash mic drop. Hey guys, I wanted to uh, talk about something that I've incorporated into my daily routine, my morning routine that has had a remarkable impact on my life. Uh, it's called BioPro Plus. Uh, it's a non-synthetic HGH uh, treatment. And, uh, you know, every year after puberty, your HGH levels naturally drop uh, and exponentially sometimes uh, can even drop by, by 50% by the time you're 35. Uh, I train jujitsu three or four times a week. I lift three or four times a week. And BioPro Plus, uh, without question, uh, enhances my ability to train more uh, days per week, harder, recover faster, uh, enhance performance. I cannot say enough good things about this product. I've been taking it for a few months. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, and I will continue to, to do so. Um, if you want to uh, you know, perform better, look better, feel better, uh, I, I can't stress it enough. I, I've tried BioPro Plus, uh, and I encourage you to go to bioproteintech.com, uh, and if you want to get $30 off your first order, use the code MikeDrop, M-I-K-E-D-R-O-P, and again, that's bioproteintech.com. I cannot stress enough. This stuff has uh, been a game changer for me as I've gotten older. So one uh, unique thing with the First Form being a sponsor of ours, um, if anybody that uses the First Form, uh, 3w.firstform slash mic drop code, um, we're having a contest where um, anybody who uses that code, we're going to do a drawing and you can um, ask a question of the guest. And so our first winner is Travis. Uh, using that uh, first form forward slash mic drop code, uh, his question for you. And, and by the way, that, that code also gives you free shipping over $75 purchases. So, uh, But Travis wanted to know uh, what was the, the scariest moment you ever had as a PJ? What's going on, Travis? Um, thanks for asking that question, man. I'm glad I got to, to relive those days. So on my 55th jump, I was a, a PJ student at the time, right? So, so in our pipeline, we get Halo qualified. And um, over at uh, Freefall School in San Diego with the SEALs, there is a, um, a civilian skydive drop zone right there. And so after you graduate the school, you can just walk right over to the civilian drop zone and get what's called your A license. And that allows you to skydive at any drop zone in the country. And there is a skydive drop zone about 30 miles south of Albuquerque, called Skydive New Mexico. And Albuquerque, New Mexico is where the, the second half of, of all PJ training is done, right? So on my weekends, um, I was obsessed with jumping. So on my weekends, I would go down to, to Skydive Arizona, rent a parachute and get a couple jumps in. I mean, they're taking us up to altitude. It's already 5,500 feet above sea level there in New Mexico, right? So if you get above 13,000 feet MSL, mean, mean sea level, you got to be on O2, all right? So to avoid that, they only take you up to about 10,500 feet uh, AGL, which is above that line anyway, right? So you get up there and you only get about 30 seconds of free fall tops, maybe 15, depending on the altitude they can release you from. So I get up there, man, and I'm jumping this rental parachute. It's the last rental available. And it was way too small for me. And, and it's, it's a big no-no to jump, jump a, a rig that doesn't fit your body properly. But I, I figured, what the heck, you know, this thing's going to open. I'm good to go. 
And so I remember, man, like, you know, I could barely get the, the leg straps around my thighs, like I barely got them on. There was, there was no slack. I mean, the, the end of the, the straps was, was right up there in the friction adapters. So, um, so not made for a division one linebacker. Not, <laughs> not, I mean, it hadn't played football at the time, but, but no, not, not made for a linebacker, but, um, so dude, you know, it takes like 20 minutes to, to get to altitude and, uh, and we get up there and, and I jump and um, I'm working on what's called sit flying. So your, your fall rate's going to be a little bit faster when, when you do free flying versus just flying belly down on, on a standard uh, halo jump, right? So I'm doing free flying and I've, I've got a lot of velocity and, and I get back to belly. Uh, I'm at altitude. I, I pulled at 3,500 feet at the time. So a wave off, pull parachute 3,500 feet, right? Uh, for civilian parachutes, the the uh, deployment handle is, is on the bottom. And I believe all military uh, parachutes are, are now going to that. But in the military parachutes at the time, you had a rip cord, right? And part of being a, a halo parachutist is, is knowing your emergency procedures to the T. Like there's a lot of things that can go wrong under canopy. All right. So the biggest thing that, that you do with, with EPs at Halo School is you, you do your checks, okay? Your, your cutaway pillow is right down here. So if you were to have any issues with your, your main parachute, you got to cut that away and then deploy your reserve parachute. And to cut it away, you have a red pillow right here on the, uh, on the right side of, of your chest strap. So remember that for later. So, so I jump out and uh, it's, it's deployment altitude, pull my parachute, and I have what's called a hard opening. And that's where your, your parachute, for whatever reason, got packed in a manner that it doesn't snivel and gradually open. The whole thing opens at the same time. And this can cause what's called a opening shock, where your whole body gets jolted. So at terminal velocity for a, a 215, 220 pounder, I mean, you're going to be falling about 150 miles an hour. When you're under a, a ram air canopy, an elliptical canopy, you're going probably 25 to 27 miles an hour forward and maybe 8 to 12 miles an hour down. So you're changing about 100 to 120 miles per hour in velocity almost instantaneously. So if you have a hard opening, I mean, it's going to shock you. You're pretty bad. That's like a car crash. It's like a car crash, man. So I had a really hard opening and I was free flying, obviously, so had a, a fast fall rate. And I don't know how this happened. Uh, the the safety officer on the ground said it's a one in a million chance that this would happen, but it happened. When I opened, my right leg strap completely came undone. So now all 200 plus pounds of me is on the left side of the parachute, okay? And I go into this death spiral and I'm <laughs> spiraling down to earth. And uh, I remember just realizing like, dude, you've got to turn out of, out of this spin or, or you're going to die. And so I look up and I'm thinking, you know, when, on a halo parachute, you have these, these brake toggles. So you steer with those toggles, but until you, you deploy them, they're, they're stuck up in, in your risers, right? That's how they're, they're packed. And so I had already unstowed my left one. I look up at my, my right toggle to, to unstow it. And, and this has got to be even more than a one in a million chance. My leg straps had wrapped around my toggles to where they were pinning the toggles down and I could no longer reach my, my toggles. So at that point, I, I realized that, that I could not steer out of this spiral. I needed to, to cut this parachute away. But when you do something muscle memory thousands of times, okay, under stress, like that's what you go to. You go to your muscle memory. So when I did my, my emergency procedures to look for my, my cutaway pillow, it was not here anymore because my, my harness had completely shifted up. I mean, and, and by the way, if I didn't have this big chin right here, I'd probably be <laughs> dead because my chin was what was holding me in the harness. The whole harness had gone up. So my head was pinned up to the sky. And when I'm reaching for my cutaway pillow, it's not there anymore. And I was jumping what's called a full face helmet. So I couldn't even look down. I couldn't see anything. Right. So at that point, like I started getting tunnel vision. I knew I was going to die unless I fixed the problem. I look at my altimeter and I'm at 2000 feet. So at this fall rate, I've probably got maybe 12 to 15 seconds before I'm at the ground toast. So 12, 15 seconds to figure this out and live. So at that point, um, I was able to, to rip off my, my full face helmet. And as I look down, like I, I realize I, I can't actually physically get my head down because my chest strap is all the way up here in my chin, pinning my head up to the sky. So I had to use like superhuman adrenaline strength to push my, my chest strap down enough for me to look down. 
I looked down and I saw my cutaway pillow. It had shifted like three feet up and it was right here, you know, on my collarbone, not down here on my lower torso as we had practiced thousands of times in emergency procedures. So I saw it and I obviously had to let go of the chest strap with one arm and that would tweak my rotator cuff. To this day, I have little rotator cuff issues and I'll never forget that 55th jump. So I see the, the red cutaway pillow, I, I pull it, and uh, I start free falling again at like 2,000 feet, man. And uh, parachutes have what's called a reserve static line, an RSL. And that's where the, the apex of, of the main canopy is connected uh, to a piece of the reserve. So as the main is getting deployed out of the rig, out of the pack, the reserve will automatically deploy. So I, I just can't believe how fast my reserve came out. It's just like, thank goodness for that reserve. Like, it, it works. Well, this time I wasn't going to let my freaking leg straps wrap around my steering toggle. So I contained the leg straps. I started going into that spin, unstowed my brake, put it on complete full 100% brakes on the right side. And I was able to, to have a, a, a straight flight path. So I go, I locate the DZ. It's a circular DZ. It's dirt. Pretty easy to see. I'm not too far from it. We must've had a, a good release by whoever our, our pilot was. And uh, I just start doing left-hand turn patterns towards the DZ, man. And I crash landed right in the middle of the DZ and, uh, and freaking lived, dude. And uh, so that was, that was my most terrifying moment. Travis, thank you for asking. But even worse, when you have something like that, okay, you, you can't be consumed by fear. So what do you think I did? I got a new parachute, got right back in the airplane and did another jump so that I can prove to myself mentally that that, that was just a fluke. It's not going to happen again. I got that jump in and uh, I've got a uh, 304 jumps now, man. Dude, that's dicey as fuck. <laughs> man, that's a trip. I mean, especially on your 55th jump, that's uh, I mean, that's saying a lot for the training too, to, for you to have the presence of mind to go through all of those processes the way that you did. Uh, were you, the level of nervousness on that immediate jump, was it like, no, I got to do this right now. And you went on autopilot and didn't even think of it and just jumped right out. Or, or were you pretty fucking nervous jumping out? I mean, it was autopilot, but I was nervous the whole time, man. Yeah. yeah. You got canopy and a fucking huge, huge weight off your shoulders. Big there. canopy, <laughs> big main canopy. Nice yeah. ride. I pulled it 5,000 feet that time though. Yeah. <laughs> man, that's a trip. Um, how hard did you hit the ground? Do you remember on the reserve? It was pretty hard, man, yeah. but it was a real padded circular, like soft dirt DZ. So it yeah. was fine. Just did a PLF feet yeah. knees together. Just yeah. like you and I talked about earlier. We spent a week doing that, right, right, Mike? Fort yeah. Benning, Georgia. You can't, uh, you can't phase the PLF. That's for sure. <laughs> that, uh, man, that's that's classic dude what a story man thank you for sharing that yeah brother all right so you come home um at that point you'd been in for i mean the the bulk of it right i mean you'd, you'd been in a while at that point what was it like coming home and and where was your head at what you know what was your train of thought you know i know it's very fresh and it's hard to reflect on something that you just did but was there much of that or, or kind of what where was your head at as you came home coming home was was weird man like um, the ops tempo was so high out there because you're doing so many missions each day and everything that you do is, is so meticulous and, and so fast paced and, and there's so much attention to detail um, that, that you can't really relax when you when you get back to the States. Like everything's a threat. Uh, there's, a, there's a mission that's going to happen all the time. You know, there's yeah. an old lady, she's about to cross the street. She's probably going to get hit by a car and you got to be ready. It was almost like I was still in mission mode. So... Um, the only thing I could think of was, was getting back over there. I mean, I was just so excited to, to redeploy. Um, but Chief Sanchez had told me all about the, the 24th Special Tactics Squadron. For our listeners out there, that's the Tier 1 unit for the Air Force. You know, the Army's got CAG, you know, Delta Force. The, uh, the Navy's got D Development Group, SEAL Team 6. And, and then uh, the Air Force has got uh, the 24th Special Tactics Squadron. So uh, just like Delta Force or SEAL Team 6, you have to assess for this unit and, and go through a more significant psychological evaluation uh, physical assessment, assessment on all of your skills, your leadership, uh, your workability with others. And, and if you get picked up, you're a tier one operator, you're a big leader, you're wearing civilian clothes to work, growing your hair out, growing your beard out, getting a whole new level of funding and, and training uh, and, and getting the real mission. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to follow in, in Chief Sanchez's footsteps. And so um, he retired uh, shortly after that, and um, the, the culture of the team started changing significantly. We got a new commander, new chief. Um, things were things were changing, man. And um, 
I realized that um, my my active time was coming up and I was about to, to be on reserve orders. And so um, I could uh, request to be put on active duty orders where you know, I'm still at the 306, I'm just working full time doing TDYs. I could request to, to be attached to another unit for deployment uh, or I could go up to the 24th STS and, uh, and assess. I had the experience, I was E5, I was a team leader and, uh, and had the, uh, the combat deployment. So I, I had the eligibility criteria to do it. Um, it was about that, uh, that time where things started getting really serious with, uh, Jessica and I, Jessica, my wife now, uh, I met her three months bef before Afghanistan. So like right away into our relationship, you know, she, she knew what a, a deployment was like. And she was a, a sophomore at uh, the university of Arizona when I, when I met her. So, uh, Jess and I started, started getting pretty serious, man. I knew I wanted to marry her, you know, it's only six to, to nine months into relationship, but man, I was very in love with this woman, you know, still am always will be, um, and I, I took her out to dinner one night. I was like, Hey, uh, th these are, these are, these are my options. This is what I'm looking at. Um, the 24th STS, here's what it is. Here's what, what our life would look like. That's option one. Option number two is to go give baseball another shot and pursue medicine. We've got like three or four PJs on our team that are reservist PJs that are full-time physicians, full-time medical doctors. They've paved the way. There's all these great programs. I've got the, the post 9-11 GI bill, babe. Like, like, here's what we're looking to do it. She's like, well, what do you want to do? You know? And, uh, I was like, I, I don't know yet. She's like, well, if you want to go to the, the, the two, four, I just want you to know, like, I support your, your dreams. And that's, that's what every woman is going to say, right. Until they're actually there. Um, so I, I pray, I prayed a lot about this and, uh, and pondered it and, and sought counsel from a lot of guys. And uh, I decided to give baseball another shot and pursue medicine and, and get put on reserve orders. So I, uh, I didn't test into a, a good enough math to make it into a university and uh, probably wasn't good enough to, to walk on the University of Arizona or baseball team. So we have this community college in, uh, in Tucson called Pima. And there's a bunch of, of great pitchers, that, uh, great baseball players, pitchers that, that go there because they, they didn't have good academics in high school or they don't want to be out of the draft for, for three years. If you're an NCAA ball player, you cannot go professionally unless basketball, uh, baseball and football and all the other sports, you can't go professionally until after you finish your junior year. So with, um, with, with baseball, if you go to a community college, you could immediately go into the draft after your freshman year. So a lot of guys call it the draft and follow program. So this Pima <clears throat> community college had some phenomenal pitchers. And I was like, dude, like this is, this is real deal, competitive college baseball. I'm going to try to walk onto this team and, and rehabilitate my arm. I've, I've had four years of, of rest. I'm 15 pounds heavier of muscle now. You know, I've got a lower body now. Like I think I'll be able to do this. So I walked on the team and, and started taking full-time classes at Pima, um, trying to get the uh, associate's degree so I could transfer to the U of A in, in pre-med. And so I, I made the team and, uh, and worked my way in, into the rotation a little bit, but my fastball was like 84. Like I got a little bit of juice on it, but, but not enough to be anything special. And uh, I went up to the coach about three months into the season. I was like, coach, man, I've, I've never quit anything in my life. I don't really consider this you know quitting per se, um, but, but, I got, I got to leave the team, man. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, coach. I, I pursued this to, to try to see if I still had it and I don't, and, and I'm just wasting, wasting time here. Like I'm a PJ part-time man. Like I could be serving my country full-time and, um, or I could be focusing on academics. I'm spending three, four hours at practice and, and I'm not doing anything, man. I'm going nowhere with this. So I hope you understand. I'm going to step away from this and, and focus on pararescue and, and focus on baseball or excuse me, academics. So, um, I left the baseball team and started focusing on school, uh, requested to get put on some more orders. And um, it was about that time that uh, I got the associate's degree and I ended up transferring to the University of Arizona. And it, it, at this time, I didn't even consider walking on the football team. I, I hadn't thought about football. Um, and uh, my mentor, actually, uh, his name was uh, Chief Master Sergeant uh, Nick McCaskill. He was a senior master sergeant at the time, E8, uh, before he got promoted to E9. But uh, we, we didn't know this. Um, but um, Nick was doing some some other work um, as a PJ. And unfortunately, um, he was he was killed in Afghanistan oh, sure. while doing that work. And, and I can't discuss uh, what that was here on this podcast. Um, but when, when Nick died, um, it 
it hurt, you know, that was, uh, not just a friend, a brother, but that was, uh, you know, like, a kind of almost like a, a uncle figure to me or something, you know, not quite a father figure, but somebody who I loved very much. And so when, uh, when, when Nick got killed, um, you know, it, it changed everything at the unit and, and the culture started changing. The leadership had changed already and, and things were different. Um, so I decided to, to really pursue uh, academics and, and not try to get put on full-time orders. And, and it was about that time that uh, I got the ambition to, to try to play football again. And football was, was my love as a kid. It's all I ever dreamed about, but baseball was, was what I was talented at and what I ended up getting that scholarship for. So I decided to start getting in shape for football. And uh, just getting eligible to try out was, was the most challenging part of the process. And getting that associate's degree and then being aligned with my major and then getting eligible by the NCAA clearinghouse, getting like my high school diploma, and like tracking that down and, and getting all these records and medical paper. It, it was tough, man. And uh, it was about that time that um, I went to jump master school down in, uh, in Florida. We had an in-house jump master school. And uh, there was a guy down there uh, named Carl Enos, may he rest in peace, as well as Bill Posh, may he rest in peace. Um, and then a guy named uh, Peterson. And uh, these three PJs that were down there in, uh, in Florida, uh, they heard that, that I was trying to make the, the U of A football team. And so these guys would, would set cones up for me and help me work on my 40 yard dash time and my pro agility and, and all of these things, man. And, um, Unfortunately, uh, those guys died in a uh, helicopter crash. Um, yeah. March 15th of 2018, I'll, I'll never forget the date. Uh, they, they passed away. Um, from what I've heard, they were actually trying to rescue some seals that were getting done with a pretty awesome mission uh, on the border of Iraq. Is what They were trying to get them over to Iraq from whatever country uh, they were doing their thing in. And uh, it was uncharted flight path and the helicopter hit power lines before they could make it. Um, to the guys that they were looking to, to pick up and uh, the, the helicopter did a free fall from 500, 800 feet and, and yeah. everyone inside uh, deceased. So um, so that's the last memory I have of, of Carl and Bill is those guys setting up cones, just being a bro, just devoting their time out of their busy day to help me achieve my goals. Um, so finished that and, and went back to, uh, to Arizona and uh, I, I made the football team, man. And just the feeling of, of being on a Division One football team, it, it, it was absolutely incredible. Um, by that time, I had two months left in my enlistment, and I decided not to re-enlist um, and, and put all my eggs in, in that, that football basket. And you know, as, as you know, and, and as a lot of your brothers know, transitioning out of special operations, it could be a very challenging thing for, for some guys, um, damn near impossible for, for some so I was very blessed to, to have that transition to where I left one team to another, one mission to another. Obviously, you know, playing a game um, doesn't compare to serving your country overseas. Um, yet this was a family to me. And, and I did have a mission. I had purpose. I knew I had structure in my life. I had order. Uh, there were uh, authority figures in my life. And, and so this was good for me to, to move on from, from special ops to, to, to football. Um, my coach was Rich Rodriguez at the time, who was a, a famous coach, um, in Michigan. And then he, he got, uh, let go there for NCAA practice, uh, violating practice laws. Cause this dude gets after it, man. We're lifting weights. We're practicing all the time. I loved coach Rod. So, uh, about three weeks after getting on the team, um, now I was just going after it in practice and just trying to crush dudes. Like usually at practice guys go like 80% because they don't want to get hurt, right? I'm going 100% every play, just trying to crush everybody and just put a stick on everybody that I can and, and highlight myself and show that, that I want to go out there and crack skulls. You know, that's what I'm here to do. Were you playing linebacker still or again? Um, they put me at, at linebacker. So I walked on it at like 220 pounds and they got me up to like 225. And, and that's a pretty small undersized linebacker for like SEC football or maybe big 12 football. But out in the, the Pac-10, the Pac-12, you know, as a linebacker, you're usually going against the spread offense. And so you got to drop back into coverage, like a short zone, or you got to blitz the edge. So it's a really fun position. You got to do, do pass coverage and a lot of edge blitzing. Uh, so it was a good little position for me at, at weak side linebacker. And, um, <clears throat> I got put on a uh, special team. So kickoff and, and kickoff return. 
and and dude, like U of A football sucks. Okay, <laughs> like we we are awful. Yeah. Right in 1996, we won 10 games and went to a major bowl game. So this is 2014, dude. That that I walk on the team, and we are freaking five and zero. Oh, okay, we're ranked tenth in the country, and we're playing USC at home, sellout crowd. We're wearing all red. You know, they call it a red out. We got college game day there. This is like a movie. Okay, and I'm starting on special teams. Got my parents or my dad in the stands. You know, got my old PJ brothers. You know, the new Chiefs in the stands watching me, and and I get to go out there and and, and crush it. Right. Well, dude, uh, I, I, I played absolutely average. I did nothing special. I mean, our, our kicker kicked it out of the end zone half the time, but I did nothing special. And, uh, and we ended up losing the game after having the opportunity to win it on a game-winning field goal. We, we missed the field goal and lost by two. And our undefeated season's over and uh, lost in, in front of the, the sellout crowd. And so Coach Rod was so pissed after that game, man. He fired me. He fired a bunch of dudes off special teams. And uh, I didn't even see the roster again until uh, we played ASU uh, out in November, just way far into the season. Um, so I know that was kind of a buzzkill that we lost the game, but dude, just being in front of 60,000 people screaming in the fans with your brothers on the field and seeing those university of Southern California boys all jacked, 240, 250 pounds, you know, running at you down the field and cracking heads with them. I mean, it was, it was a, a very surreal experience and yeah. I'm very grateful to, to have been able to, to play against those boys that day. Dude, no doubt. That's wild. I got a level with you guys. Uh, I shaved my sack. Yeah, I said it. Uh, it's Smooth Sack Summer 2023, if you haven't heard already. Uh, make sure that you're scaped from pubes to bum. That's right. This summer, keep your balls cool while looking hot with Manscaped. I've been a big supporter of the show for a while now, and they're the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. And they're making sure that we all have a ball this summer by giving our pants partners everything they need to stay fresh. Dive headfirst into smooth sack summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free sh shipping with our code. Uh, the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to prepare for that summer bod. They've built the ultimate grooming bundle for your summer grooming. The Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer has a cutting edge ceramic blade uh, to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin skate skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor. 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 Uh, that was not an accident. New multifunction on off switch, um, and it gives you the ability to turn the 4,000 K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. Uh, this trimmer is also waterproof, so beach, lake, shower, uh, whatever, it will devour even the strongest pubes. Uh, now that you got the perfect haircut, I know I do. Uh, use Manscapes liquid formulations to keep that freshness even at the hottest summer barbecues. Most importantly, use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, which is a real crowd favorite to stay cool in the heat. Uh, they're even throwing in two gifts for their Performance Package 4.0. That's the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. And uh, they're also throwing in some Shears 2.0, a nail grooming kit. Uh, which is a stainless steel nail uh, cutter, tweezer, and grooming scissors. So if you throw in the code mic drop, all one word, you get 20% off plus free shipping. Manscaped, I've been using their stuff for years now, even before they sponsored the show. They've been a, a phenomenal supporter of the Mic Drop podcast, and this deal is amazing. Plus, again, if you use the code mic drop, it's 20% off plus free shipping. I don't know how you beat that. So Take care of your undercarriage this summer with Manscaped. That's manscaped.com. Code mic drop, 20% off plus free shipping. Do it. I mean, fuck, what a, what a transition, first of all. Um, the, why did he fire you? Like, like specifically, he said, you're fucking gone, or he just hears a list of people that fucking suck? A, a bunch of guys, man. He just, you, you know, when, when you lose a game like that as a coach, you want change. You, you want to try something new, and there's also got to be consequences. So uh, he put me on that team to go knock a dude out, man. He put me on that team to go stick somebody and set the tone and do some damage to the other team, and I didn't do that. Um, I was more focused on keeping my position and not making mistakes. And, and that's not my mentality. My mentality is to focus on the objective, focus, focus on mission success, block the negative out. You don't want to focus on what not to do. Yeah. You want to focus on what to do and get fixated on that target, right? Yeah. I got some bad advice and that advice was, 
hey, make sure you're not off sides. Make sure you don't do any blocks in the back. Make sure you don't clip anyone. Make sure you don't do any helmet to helmet. Like, Jason, this is a different game than when you were playing in high school. Watch out for that targeting and, and all that. So I'm over here all nervous, kind of like containing the beast instead of unleashing myself on the enemy. So uh, I didn't execute my game plan. We lost the game, so I deserve to get fired off special teams. Now, I would have liked to have, you know, gotten another shot a couple yeah. weeks later, yeah. you know, not get freaking benched for, you know, basically the rest of the season. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, man. So I'm, I'm curious, the, the missed field goal, I've always wondered. I, I, I can only imagine that I know it's a team sport, you know, whatever, but when, when it comes down to that and we can win or lose and it's based on a field goal and the dude loses, does most of the team, even if they don't say it, are they like you motherfucker? Yes. Okay. Dude, like So it is that way. Every single and dude like, yeah, I, I'm I'm a PJ at the time, right? So like I'm still trying to be a good dude and have integrity and be professional. Like every single one of us felt that way. Yeah. But at the it's same like time, you, you shitbird. Dude, yeah, we all felt that way, but at the same time, you know, that's also your teammate, so you try to make it a point to, to go up to him and, and give him a little hug real quick and be like, "Hey man, we're going to bounce back and get it next time." So I, I definitely did that to, to Casey. Casey Scourin was his name, you know, he's freaking yeah. bawling his eyes out man you know it yeah. broke his heart uh but he ended up getting a couple game winners that year too so so yeah. good on you casey yeah wild shit um i i have to or i guess i'm curious uh, i have to ask coming from a pj environment of an active duty special operations you know professionalism and you know er earning your spot every single time i've heard you know d different stories of how division one high level ncaa athletics are you know, certain stars getting coddled and, and just, you know, a very immature kind of culture in, in some ways. Did you struggle with being going from that environment into a college team where these kids are five, six years younger than you? And like, were there any problems? Did they look at you like, who's this fucking old guy? Or like, what, what was that like? Not at all, man. I, I went fully immersed into that culture and I had an absolute blast. My teammates loved me. I loved them. I invested in them. They invested in me. It was a lot of fun. You know, a lot of these guys are 18, 19, 20 years old, African-American, coming from rough backgrounds, rough neighborhoods. And me being able to, uh, to get to know them and build relationships with these guys uh, was, was very special to me. And uh, I made some, some really close friends on that team. You know, it didn't matter if they came from a different part of the country, if, if their skin looked different than mine, if they're younger than me. We were brothers, man, and I love those guys to death. So just like the military. Just like the military. Yeah. And, and the, way that, the way that a college football team is operated uh, is very militaristic. Really? And, and yeah, you've got your issues, right, with, you know, stars doing this or doing that. But Coach Rod ran a tight, tight ship, man. I yeah. mean, there was a lot of discipline on our football team. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Is there is there anything that would surprise the listener about uh, you know in the locker room or, or the th things that go on be behind closed doors on a high level Division One college football team? No, just just the money that goes into it and the level of support. I mean, just the the blessings that you know, the gifts that you're given as a football player. I mean, the the world is at your fingertips in those four years that you're playing ball. Um, kind of like you, when when you graduate the uh, SQT or when you graduate PJ training, you get to your unit and you get all this gear issued. You get ice climbing gear and halo equipment and different optics to choose from, from your weapon. And you got all different types of LBVs and camos for, for Arctic situations and ice climbing gear. Crazy, right? Well, it's kind of the same way when it comes to, to D1 football. What's the craziest thing you got? Oh man. Um, I got, um, so, so I got uh, a, a new set of cleats every week for practice and a new set of cleats for every single game. Uh, when we would, when we would play at a way stadium, we'd have a police escort take us everywhere that we went. Uh, we had sports medicine doctors that were full time for our, uh, for our football team. Um, and then the, the weight room, Mike was, was like no weight room I've ever seen before. Yeah. I, I lived in there, dude. It was phenomenal. So just the, you know, the NCAA isn't going to give you a whole lot of material objects, but the, the level of support that they gave us was, yeah. was just phenomenal. Uh, I've never seen support like that. And then when you make it to a bowl game, we made it to a major BCS bowl game, a Fiesta bowl that year. 
I mean, dude, the, the amount of gear that we got was was incredible. Your yeah. sweatsuits, hats, your know, bags, backpacks, duffel bags, shoes, socks. It was just phenomenal. Then they give you like a PlayStation, and I think I got like a, a Yeti cooler and, yeah. and all these bowl gifts. It was a great time, yeah. man. Yeah, that's wild. Who did you guys play in the bowl game? We played Boise State. They were tough, man. Did uh, did you guys lose? We lost by yeah. two. Yeah, damn. Was yeah. it the field goal again? No, nah, man, we, we tried to we tried to go for two and, oh, and tie the ball game, and we actually uh, we lost. Yeah, yeah, damn. Yeah. Wild shit. Um, see, all right, so that year transpires. Next year, did you play again? Yeah, I played again next year. Uh, was in talks of getting a scholarship, uh, and that really motivated me. And so I started doing three a days. Like we'd have our workout, right? And then I would do two additional workouts, whether that was like some type of cardio or some type of like alternate training or just another uh, strength training session or whatever it may be. Uh, I was really close to, to getting a scholarship and getting on that depth chart. Um, so unfortunately, man, um, in overtraining, I actually blew out my ACL and meniscus really? in 2015. And this led to a, a downward spiral of events uh, that ended my football career. Did it just, uh, w once it happened, it just spiraled like continuously until it was done? Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the rehabilitation I got from UAA football was, was phenomenal, but long story short, um, because I was a walk on, um, I injured my knee off season and off campus because I was a walk on. Apparently I don't have medical coverage for a situation like that. However, the U of A went ahead and pushed me through as if I was any other player. And so I got slapped with a $12,000 medical bill and, and you know, I'm not working. Right. Were, were you still not on, in reserves? I'm out at okay. that time. Yeah. Yeah. So my enlistment had, uh, had finished up two months into the season okay. of, of 2014. So this is 2015. And uh, now I got slapped with a, a $12,000 medical bill. I had just gotten married and spent like all of that cash I racked up in Afghanistan on a ring, on the yeah. wedding. On all the important shit. All of the important <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm broke, man. And now I got a $12,000 medical bill. And, uh, and that was rough for me. So um, if that wasn't bad enough, I had changed my major to general studies so that I could focus more on football. So I, I wasn't uh, studying biochemistry anymore. And when I did that, um, somehow I had made myself ineligible. So um, not only did I have the, the ACL tear and the meniscus, but as soon as I recovered and was ready to play again, I, I was now ineligible. Um, so 2015 was was my last football season, and, and that was kind of a sad ending to a, a pretty exciting uh, part of my story. Yeah, man, yeah. that's rough. How, was that something that, uh, like, mentally you struggled with uh, or – all of the different things you'd been through with prior military, did that help the kind of the mental resiliency of, of working through that or how did it affect you? It was tough, man. You know, I'd never dealt with an injury before and that's a different type of demon, you know, when you can't walk and, and you're defenseless and you're really needy and you can't even yeah. you know, defend yourself, you know, if somebody were to, you know, try to rob you or attack you or whatever it may be, you know, so you feel weak. Uh, and then just all the rehabilitation that goes with it and the medication and, and getting crushed here or getting cr uh, crutched here and getting out of this vehicle and crutch into this class and getting yeah. carted to, to that class. And then it was uh, it was a lot, man. And, and, and definitely like being a PJ uh, helped me be more resilient during those times. Uh, but it was tough, man, because, yeah. you know, it kind of felt like I got the rug pulled out from under yeah, me again. For sure. Um how long, how long was the, the healing process? Like from the time you injured it until, and did you injure it playing? So I injured it off season, off campus. There was a group of us that got together to, uh, to play five on five basketball. It's fucking around. And I'm thinking, dude, it, it, it is for our listeners out there. That's when you get injured it's when you're, when you're screwing around, yeah, especially yeah. basketball. It's Don't play basketball. Games. <laughs> it's all fun and games till you fucking blow out your ACL. Yeah, uh, man, that sucks. Uh, so from the time you injured it until it was at least healed to where normal daily routine shit, you're back to normal. What was that time span? Dude, it was five and a half months. Yeah, it was yeah. it was really quick. I got cleared to play after five and a half months. It was like a, a record for the school. But unfortunately, when I got cleared, uh, we were in spring for, for my third season. And that's when I got found ineligible. And there was there was nothing that I could do. Yeah. Um, wow. So at that point, you know, I got $12,000 medical bill. Uh, football's over. I got a blown out ACL and, um, and I decided to, to drop out of school. And so, uh, when I dropped out, um, unfortunately there was some miscommunication and instead of them giving me W's withdrawals on my transcript, they gave me F's. 
So I was, when I tried to like transfer to another school and try to play for another university, uh, they're like, yeah, dude, we can't take you. Like you're ineligible. So I, I go back to the U of A. I'm like, Hey, what's going on? They're like, I've got F's on my transcript. They're like, Oh, you know, you didn't fill this medical withdrawal out. And so I do all the medical withdrawal paperwork. It was pretty challenging. And I turn it in and, and three months has gone by and I'm like, Hey, uh, you know, not trying to bother you guys, but, uh, you know, where's my, my paperwork. And they're like, Oh, you, you submitted it incorrectly. Why did you guys tell me, man? It's been three months. You know, they're like, hey, you need to do this, this, and this. So, I submit it correctly, and uh, and I get the W's on my transcript. You know, my GPA is back above three at that time, and I'm able to at least get back into school, and uh, and try to finish that degree in biochemistry. Did you stay at U of A? I stayed at U of A. Uh, um, how old were you uh, the two years that you played? I was 24 when I walked on the team, okay. um, and then 26 yeah. whenever I, I got right. out. Yeah. Um, what was your, I got, I got to ask, what was your max bench squat and clean at, <laughs> at the height of your football career? Yeah, man. Uh, I benched 385. Uh, I squatted 455. And then I, I don't remember what the clean was, man. I, I believe it was uh, 275. And then uh, uh, my, my claim to fame was a, a 4.67 in the 40 yard dash when wow. I tried out. Oh, shit. Uh, and then I, I didn't run, run anything under a, a 4.8 when I was actually on the team. Um, maybe it was all that extra weightlifting we were doing yeah. or, or whatever it may be being sore all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm curious the, the workouts, uh, in the gym and, and otherwise compared to some of the things you went in the military, how, how do they compare? No joke, man. Like those D one football workouts are, are no joke. I mean, yeah. they, they push guys to the max. We had yeah. dudes throwing up in the weight room and, and, you know, the workouts are a good hour and a half. And then you, you do 20 minutes of cardio afterwards. So you know, it doesn't compare to the dynamics of selection where you're doing, you know, swimming, um, water confidence exercises, ruck marching, you know, calisthenic evaluations and distance running. But as far as, you know, being a grinder and really breaking your body down, it was no joke, man. Yeah. I, I'd put it, I'd put it closely up there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you guys ever do pull-ups on the football team? Yeah. Did, yeah. We did weighted pull-ups. Did you have competitions of who could do the most pull-ups? Oh yeah. I smoke everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. That's good to hear. Uh, one question I'm curious of is, were there any other guys on the team that not saw you as a threat, but kind of wanted to like test you? Like this dude's a, a military special operations guy. Like I want to see if I can like almost a shot at the title or like, was there any of that? Even if it was like friendly competition, like wanted to, to, to test you? No, man. Um, these guys, uh, they loved me, man. It was almost, you know, they come up to me and, and, you know, show me love. If, if anything, um, yeah. yeah, I try to present myself as, as, as a funnier, positive individual when I first got to the team, you know, messing with guys and joking around and having a good time. So, you know, I didn't really try to, um, you know, try to act like a badass or, yeah. or, or get guys to fear me. I didn't really try to talk about the military much. You know, my, my new identity was a football player. So, yeah. so that's what I tried to, to focus on. I gotcha. Was there any hazing on the team? Not really, man. Not really. You know, when you and I, I mean, you know, you're a little bit older than me, Mike, not, not a ton more, but you know, when you and I were in high school, there's hazing, man, you know, you, Dude, you, I mean, was there not in, in PJ, the PJ pipeline? Oh yeah. The fucking seal teams is brutal with hazing or they were, they're probably not anymore, but. Oh yeah. I, I've heard, you know, they're probably attending fucking pride parades at this point. I've heard some of you guys' stories, man. It's pretty nasty, but, but no, not, not a lot of hazing, um, at the, at the U of A. Yeah. Anything else that I haven't asked you about the, uh, the football experience that, that people would find interesting? Um, as far as, uh, being, being a division one football player, uh, it's, it's a science, man. Like you look at it from the outside in and, and you see these guys just kind of running around the field, but it's extremely scientific and, and the footwork that goes into it and, and just practicing hitting the right angles and execution of, of plays. I mean, you've got, a, you've got 11 guys on offense, 11 guys on defense. And, you know, you've got to execute this play to perfection. Everyone has a role and the average play is between five and six seconds. Right. And then you got a break and, and then you're on to the next play. So, um, for our listeners out there, I, I say that the thing behind the scenes that, that maybe you don't realize about college football is, I mean, guys are, are putting in 20 to, to 40 hours a week on their craft. I yeah. mean, it, it is just it's a full time a science. Yeah. So, there's been a lot of negativity wrapped around paying players. I just missed that, and I wouldn't have gotten paid anything anyway as a walk-on. But, um, but I, I feel that those players do deserve to be paid 100%. Dude, I agree. I, I think all college sports. I mean, when you look at the revenue that they bring in, uh, to me, it's 
criminal that they don't, honestly. I mean, at that level, like it's one thing, you know, if, if it's just, you know, part of the college experience and, and, you know, whatever team you're on, it really isn't doing anything for the university. I mean, I hate to look at it that way, but the university is a business the same way anything else is. And for the love of Christ, like those football teams are bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars, you know? So, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's a, uh, a, cr- a criminal aspect of, of the college experience at, at that super high, high level division. We one. got a 10, the university got a $10 million check just for us making the Fiesta Bowl. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, oh, one thing I've always been curious about football wise, you hear a lot about coaching, right? Like in, in post performance interviews, coaches will, like will, will either credit the other coach or take responsibility. Like, oh, it was shitty coaching. Like as a player, how how big of of a role does does coaching actually play in whether or not you guys win the game? It seems like that's a, a humble way for a coach to try to take accountability for for the game being lost. Is it that? Is there that much to it? Yeah, there's there's so much to coaching, man. And I mean, you've got an offensive coordinator, you got a defensive coordinator, you got a special teams coach, you got a head coach, an assistant head coach. And then you've got a linebackers coach, receivers coach, defensive backs coach, lineman coach. And I mean, just the amount of, of work, technique, mentorship, execution, uh, film room stuff that they they put in with the players in the week is, is incredible. And then you got your weight room coaches. Like our weight room was, was state of the art, yeah. phenomenal top tier facility. Uh, we had six full-time strength coaches in there and then four or five interns. And when it comes down to game day, uh, coaching plays a, a huge role. You know, you've, you've got a bunch of players that know how to catch footballs, hit people in the mouth, throw the football, but the coach is the one that tells them how to move together, what to do, when to do it. And, you know, there's so much strategy that comes into coaching in football. You may spend an entire first half trying to expose or disguise a certain scheme and be studying the other team. And then the second half, you have something that's completely different. Or you may come into the game with a, a completely predetermined game plan based on all the scouting and the film study that you've done in this team. And you already know what you're going to run. So you're not feeling the team out at all. You're just executing your game plan. I mean, these coaches, it's it's very scientific. I mean, we had, we had four coaches whose job was just to sit up in the sky box and just watch the other team the whole time. We had one coach who just watched the other team's coach and tried to pick off plays from him and, and relay that on down to other coaches. Yeah. I mean, it was, gosh, wow. man, there must have been, we had a hundred something players on our roster. There, there must have been 30 something coaches. Wow. Do you have any idea what the, the football budget is? For the year, do you have any idea what it was? No idea, man. But these guys get paid big bucks. Oh, no. I mean, some of those coaches are making uh, ten million, twelve million dollars a year. It's it's wild. Yeah. I mean, but again, if if the football program is bringing in ten x that, then you know people bitch about that stuff. But I mean, to me, capitalism and business is is pretty uh, consistent, irrespective of what the product is. I mean, you may think like, oh, it's football, it's a fucking game. Well, it's still a product, and it still brings in a shit ton of money. You know, so. Uh, I'm, I'm not mad at it, but, um, all right. So you lose in a, in, in a ability, uh, you end up going back to school full time and, and you finished, right? Yeah. And, and the cool thing about that, and this is one of the things that I love, uh, about my walk with God is, um, I see God as almost like a PJ, like a PJ didn't cause the wound. The PJ didn't create that situation. The PJ comes in to rescue. And it's pretty cool how God can can use things like a blown out ACL or or like my past before I went into pararescue and, and turn that into good and turn that into success. So when I got back into school, uh, I requested some some research credits because I'm, I'm trying to go to med school. And I talked to my academic advisor, I'm like, look, you know, uh, I just finished up playing football. Uh, I, I'm majoring in biochemistry. You know, here's my interest. Do you know anyone that, that maybe I could do some research for that's more down the, the sports alley in science? And she's like, I got just the guy for you. And so at that point, I got connected with Dr. Ricardo Valerdi, who is a full professor at the University of Arizona, but he's also the CEO of a company called The Science of Sport. And you may have seen on like ESPN, whenever they like break down a big hit or like a fastball or like a, a jump shot, and then they'll go over like the science behind it, like how much power was put into that hit or how far the ball had to be thrown in at what angle or, or whatever. It's very interesting stuff. So he runs that company and he also has a nonprofit. 
And so I started doing research for him, and this was a concussion research, which was super interesting. And we actually uh, applied for a grant, and, and this was actually a competition. It was called the, the Mind Matters Challenge, and the grant funding came from the NCAA and the DOD, which this is like perfect for me. It's like military and college sports. So what, what the challenge was, was whichever team develops the best educational tool to help uh, concussion awareness with college sports wins. And so what we ended up doing is uh, we built this virtual reality phone app um, where you would catch punts. So, so you, you had this little thing called Google Cardboard and it was like a, a VR splitter, virtual reality. So you didn't have to buy some crazy virtual reality thing. Google Cardboard costs like two bucks if it's bought in bulk. So long story short, you, you hold the phone up to your face and you catch punts at the University of Arizona Stadium. And then you get a concussion in virtual reality, and then you get to catch punts experiencing in, in VR some of the symptoms that you would experience for a grade two concussion. So my argument coming into the research was, was Doc, as a football player, I'm going to tell you, man, when I'm in the heat of battle, as long as I don't go unconscious, I'm staying in the fight. I'm not thinking about long-term health goals or what this is, the damage is going to cause me. I'm focused on the battle. So if I get a grade two concussion, a grade two concussion being I'm not going unconscious, but maybe I'm experiencing some type of dizziness, uh, color vision impairment, um, lack of reaction time, lethargy, uh, maybe lightheadedness, some of these symptoms that, that you get with a grade two concussion, you're still conscious. And so where we really see long-term damage done in athletes is when they get multiple concussions in a small period of time and they're not able to rehabilitate from that, right? Because only a handful of concussions will you go unconscious. If, if an athlete goes unconscious, you know, no brainer, they got a concussion. We got to pull them out of the game, put them through concussion protocol, rehab them, keep them out of training for now, right? So my whole argument was, hey, doc, how many of these athletes do you think have really even had a grade two concussion before they go in? How, how are they even going to know how to report a concussion if they don't know the symptoms? So are we just going to punch them in the head and, and give them those symptoms? No. How about we simulate those symptoms for them? So I ended up going from, from being like a researcher to like his, his program manager on the project, coming up with the script, coming up with all the marketing, meeting with all like the, uh, the techie nerds and, and kind of helping them like bring everything to life and how to make it look realistic. And back before drones were even a thing, we brought a drone into Arizona football stadium and like got it all into virtual reality. So you're like legit catching punts in Arizona stadium, getting hit by Scooby Wright, who was the uh, NCAA defensive player of the year. He was, he was uh, a guy, Arizona wildcat. And, and so Scooby in the flesh come down and hit you in the face and, and boom, you get a concussion. So after trying to, to catch these, these punts with concussion symptoms, you realize like, dude, I don't have the skill that I do before. So our goal with that was to, to show these athletes firsthand that if you get a concussion and you can't perform, you're only hurting your team. So it's not about what you want. It's about the fact that you can't play to the same ability level that you would. And we felt that that was going to, to really be what would convince players to, to report their concussions in the heat of battle and, and, and allow and take themselves off the field. Yeah. Right. Well, we ended up winning the, the DOD Mind Matters Challenge and getting the grant. And, and it was a big grant, man. And so uh, I got cut in on, on some of the grant money. And uh, I realized that, that whatever Doc did, this, this was more down my alley. And I remember like being on a plane flight one time and the person I sat next to told me after the very limited time of speaking with the person told me, I don't see you being a doctor one day, working inside of a hospital, waiting for somebody to give you a paycheck, having to deal with people on the worst day of their life. Like I could see you being like a coach or something. And I like, look, a coach, like, yeah, who do you think you are type of thing? You know, a coach, a doctor. Well, now I, I knew what that person was talking about. You know, this was something that I had never been exposed to. And this was business, man. And, and you know, business was so exciting and, and being able to, to put together forms and publications and go and try to procure funding for an initiative and an effort, working together, collaborating. And uh, so Doc uh, took me under his wing 
and uh, taught me a lot about business and systems engineering. Uh, I minored, minored in systems and industrial engineering, learning how to, to take an idea and, and put it into a, a no kidding concrete form that, that works, uh, developing systems and processes for ideas. Uh, and my senior year at the U of A, I, I decided to incorporate SOCOM Athlete LLC, which has uh, been my company for six years now, man. Dude, that's amazing. That's, uh, man, the, the transition is, uh, m- makes a lot of sense, and it's also super inspiring. I mean, I think for for anybody listening out there, and we, you know, we have a lot of uh, military and law enforcement uh, listeners, which, you know, that kind of to your point it, it is an identity, you know, and, and it's one that, especially if you start right out of high school and you spend, you know, years and years, it's difficult to transition out into something else, you know, and I think, uh, you know, your, your story is super inspiring uh, for anybody, you know, that's in that position to be able to, to kind of find their why and, and purpose and whatever. It's, that's, that's amazing. Um, so what, once you started that kind of where, where has it gotten into to where you're at today? Yeah, man. So <clears throat> after incorporating it, uh, I graduated shortly after. Um, what even enabled this this company to, to be what it is is, is an interesting story. Uh, when I tore my ACL meniscus, I've never been a, a social media guy until I got into business. Um, I like to I like to remain anonymous, be behind the scenes. But when I tore out my ACL and meniscus, uh, I started social media. Uh, because I got sick of people texting me. Uh, when, when you play football, you, you got a big network. There's there's a lot of people that uh, you become friends with or, or whatever it may be. And I just felt like every day I was getting text messages like, hey, how's your knee or whatever it is. I'm like, you know what, man? I'm just going to get back on Facebook. I'm going to create an Instagram. And, and once a week or so, I'll give a little update on, on how things are going. And so uh, I got on Instagram and uh, started doing my thing. And, and every once in a while, yeah, I was out. So I'd post like a, a little PJ picture. Um post like some football stuff, you know, nothing crazy. And, and the following started to, to grow surprisingly fast. And there was uh, this Instagram page in 2017. And keep in mind, like you know, six years ago, Instagram wasn't what it is now. I mean, now just about every major brand is, is on Instagram. Everybody knows about Instagram. I mean, it is the platform. Um, so I got on Instagram and, uh, and I had this page message me one time and the page was called combat videos. And they were like the only page of their, their kind at the time. And they posted like special operator content and, and no kidding, like combat video footage, just quick clips of, you know, something happened in Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever it may be. And this dude reaches out to me one time. He's like, Hey man, I saw that picture on your profile of you and your dad serving together is, is PJs. Do you mind if I share that picture on my account? I'm like, sure, dude, you know, go ahead. And so, uh, I guess the post was like one of the, the best posts he had ever had. And so he came back and was like, Hey dude, you know, I'd love to, to get some more content from you. I'm like, yeah, man, here, here you go. You know, here's a video of my dad and I having a, a shooting competition, you know, as PJs one, one time, you know? Here's a you know, halo jump that, that I filmed, you know, an Eloy or whatever, you know, gave him some content. Well, he comes back about a month later and it's like, hey man, uh, I got to take a trip overseas. And this guy was a veteran, by the way, army vet. He's like, hey dude, I got to take a trip overseas. And uh, I was wondering if you want to run this Instagram page while I'm gone. And I'm, just, I'm like, V man, I, I don't, you have like 20,000 followers. At the time, you know, 20,000 was a lot on Instagram, you know, cause there wasn't a lot of, of users. 20,000 was, was, was a big number. So it was a little intimidating. It was like, dude, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to make you look bad. He's like, dude, you're going to do fine. Just, just do you. So I, I get on his Instagram page, you know, and I'm like looking for content and doing content searches and learning about aspect ratios and, and how to format things properly. And, and I type good captions and just basic kind of social media management stuff. And this dude like never comes back, Mike. He's, he's like never comes back. And so it's been like three months, man. I've been running combat videos and he finally comes back and he like texts me. It's like, hey dude, um, you're doing really good with the page. I'd like for you to keep it. I'm like, bro, I, I don't know what to do with your page, you know? And he's like, dude, keep it. And so uh, I'm like, what should I do here? I'm like, oh yeah. I'm going to change the name of this page to SOCOM Athlete. So I changed the name of the page to SOCOM Athlete. I unfollowed everyone that he followed. I deleted all of his posts. Uh, I hired uh, Jessica's sister to uh, create me a, a logo. 
and uh, I established an identity for the page. And the page was special operations, training tips, and, and recruiting Q&A. And so every day I would get on there and answer DMs and, um, and I would give advice. I'd post up good content that was specifically for special operations training, whether it be information or videos or whatever it may be. And we started growing, man. And I started getting questions over time about uh, recruiting questions, tons of them. And then I got lots of questions on how to train. And by this time, man, you know, I've gone from being a, a division one athlete to a, a pararescue man, and then going from being a pararescue man to a different type of division one athlete, and then going through a whole knee surgery and rehabilitation. Um, I knew all about how to train. It was my thing. I was like, dude, like this, this is, this is what I'm, I'm good at. Like I just finished up this human performance stint with the DSRI. I got the degree in biochemistry. I can, I can really do this. So, um, I started offering personal training and kind of using this SOCOM athlete Instagram platform to, to brand us. And so my, my clients were individuals that were, were sworn in or in college uh, or whatever and, and wanted help getting ready for their, their, PS, their Navy PST or their Air Force pass test, as it was called at the time, for pararescue, combat control trainees or whatever it may be. So uh, I put it up. I created a website myself through Wix. And, and man, that was a lot to learn how to do web design. Um, one of the most daunting tasks to this day that I still have is, is web design. But uh, but built a website, got the social media platform, got the business cards, got the brand, the logo. And, and now it's time to uh, to start e-commerce and, and open up products on the website. And, and that product was personal training. Uh, so I started picking up um, guys to train and my, my primary client were, were guys that wanted help with water confidence. Like, Hey man, how do, how do I do underwater swim? How do I tread water? What's, what's that keyhole stroke um, for underwater swim? What's that egg beater kick for treading water that, you know, what knots should I be tying under the water? What should my time be? Can you work with me on my technique? And so that was really where I got most of my business was teaching guys how to do pool comp. And then I'd have some dudes that needed help with running and, and a lot that needed help with Olympic lifting, some with mobility. And over time, I had too many clients. So I had to create group development training. And this was all in Tucson. And so uh, after doing the group development training, um, I realized that I needed to try to do an event. And so I figured for the event, uh, I would invite the local uh, Navy special warfare recruiter and, and the local Air Force special warfare recruiter to come out. I charge like 36 bucks for the event, try to get like 15 dudes come out, run a PT test, do some pool comp, a little rucking, smoke session, and call it a day. And so I did that first event in October of, of 2017 and uh, got a lot of positive feedback from it. Uh, bought some logs, bought some rubber training rifles, some, some basic equipment, got a little insurance policy and, uh, and started running these events in San Diego, San Antonio, Arizona. And uh, we started calling them Hell Day. And so uh, I had a couple team guys uh, from the West Coast that would come out and help me out run these events. And then in Texas, I'd have active duty PJs that would come out. In Tucson, we had PJs. We had all kinds of former SEALs, whatever it would be. And, and it was primarily young stud active duty guys and, and retired guys that had phenomenal stories. We'd come out and, and mentor these guys for a seven to eight hour day. And, and put them through a, a taste of selection. So it wasn't like a, hey, you know, here's how bad you suck. It was, hey man, like we're gonna put you through this and we're gonna guide you and kind of help you get through it. And it's more necessary than ever when you look at just how soft the generations have become and, and how they don't spend as much time outdoors and, and going through the physical grind that we used to and, you know, scraping knees and, and, you know, trying to figure out how to get from one place to the other by asking the lady at the gas station and looking at the phone book and learning how to read maps like that. Those days are gone. So we started seeing a, a lot of popularity from these events and uh, SOCOM Athlete continued to grow and continued to grow. Um, I started getting into programming um, after all the curriculum development I did and, and after all the, the things I've learned about working out. Um, I took three weeks to, to actually build a PJ prep program. Uh, called up my boy Isaiah Staley, who was a, a PJ that uh, commissioned and, and went to BUDS and became a SEAL officer. He had retired. I'm like, hey man, I'd like for you to help me build a, a BUDS prep program. Went to some of the Green Berets that I knew. I'd like for you guys to help me build a Green Beret prep program. So we, we had prep programs for, for most of the, the 13 major special operations career fields that were available on the website, uh, as well as a customized meal plan teamed up with a nutritionist. And so we could do customized meal plans. And so we started taking the operation more from doing in-person development in, in Tucson to running these larger events across the country and offering products online. 
one thing led to another man. And, and here we are six years later and we've ran 75 of these hell day events. And, and we got a government contract to run these events with national guard, special forces recruiting 50 studs coming out there. Almost all of them are passing their fitness test. And, and these guys are, are having life changing experience at these events. Uh, we've had over 300 individuals in the last five years that have come through these events that are now graduated operators with That's hundreds awesome. more in the pipeline, man. Yeah. And, and, and now most of the instructors that I have come out to the events are guys that came through years ago yeah. and, and are now on the SEAL teams or are yeah, now that's Green awesome. Berets. That's um, got to be rewarding as shit. It feels amazing, Mike. Yeah. You know, and and we're out of the crawl phase. You know, for our listeners out there, you refer to a lot of things as a crawl phase, a walk phase, and a run phase. We're finally out of the crawl phase and we're in the walk phase. So it's still quite a grind, but we're really finally establishing our identity. Uh, we're getting government contracts. And uh, it's, it's just very exciting, man. And it's very humbling um, to, to kind of find uh, what I do best in my own little niche and, and yeah. what I can offer the military and offer the country. Yeah, dude, that's awesome, man. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to hear that. That's great stuff. Uh, when did you move from Arizona back to Florida? We moved there October of 2019, man. Okay. So just before the pandemic. And yeah. I, I tell you what, Mike, Florida was a heck of a place to live during the pandemic versus, yeah. versus Arizona. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, that's wild. Um, yeah. Anything else that you want to talk about uh, with SOCOM Athlete? Like, uh, I know you've got some dates coming up, uh, August, a couple in October, November, December, uh, Dustin, Denver, Virginia Beach, Miami, San Clemente. I mean, they're all over the place, right? Yeah, absolutely. If you are training for special operations, your journey should start with SOCOM Athlete, whether it be uh, getting on our podcast, obviously, Make sure you listen to Mike's podcast. Uh, hop on our podcast. Listen to to some of our guests. Um, we're going to talk all about special operations training and, and tips for being successful at selection. Um, our workout prep programs online. We've got one for for every career field of varying ability levels. Uh, we've got a customized meal plan. Uh, our held day events. Most of them are now free to attend, courtesy of the United States military. So when you come out to these events, you're going to see a bunch of instructors in uniform. Um, the coupon code for our next held the event in Destin is F L A R N G. You type that coupon code in on the website. The held day no longer costs 108 bucks. It's hundred percent free. Oh, wow. So if you really want to be an operator, come on out and see us at held day, get a 14 hour experience, get some training, some mentorship, see how you stack up. Yeah. That's awesome. Good shit. Uh, what med kit do you keep in your car? <laughs> if any, uh, r real basic, man. So like, you know, as a PJ, sometimes, you know, you want to get all into like IVs and like chest darts and, and stuff like that. But I'm a non-current paramedic now, yeah. man. So I don't want to be getting into all that. So yeah. just a occlusive dressing, gauze, a little bit of tape and a tourniquet. And uh, as far as, uh, have you have you ever heard of any, any of the quick clots oh, yeah. out there? Yeah, keep a little quick clot yeah. as well. And, and that's about it, man. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, anything that I didn't ask you that I should have? Shoot, man, I I, I can't I can't think of, of, of anything, brother. All right. Um, is PJ training harder than SEAL training? Maybe. <laughs> what, what do you think? I don't know, man. You'd have to go through both, right? Yeah. And there's only one guy who's uh, who's done that that I know of, and that's Isaiah Staley, who I, I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So. Did you ask him about it? Of course, man. What did he say? He said Bud's was more of a grinder, but PJ <laughs> training was harder when it came to to the pool and, and evaluation. So he said he couldn't really tell which one was tougher. Yeah. But uh, if you look at the the pure data, uh, the pararescue washout rate is is above is ninety percent. It's yeah. ninety ninety five, right? So yeah. uh, the pipeline is is about two and a half years long. You got five hundred PJs, but. The, the caliber of individuals that pursue the SEAL teams, in my opinion, are generally um, going to be a higher caliber uh, that you see pursuing Air Force Special Warfare. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have a bunch of studs pursuing yeah. Air Force Special. That doesn't mean you're not going to have some Olympic athletes uh, by all means. But typically, the guys that pursue the SEAL teams are guys that want to be the best. Yeah. And so uh, the Air Force is really working on getting that high caliber individual to, to try to, to go uh, for these Air Force Special Warfare careers. Uh, and that's where SOCOM Athlete can, can really help out with, yeah. with our branding and our events and being able to get these Air Force Special Warfare operators out there in front of guys to, to talk about their mission. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, when it comes to, to the SEAL teams, um, you know, I, I think everyone can, can agree that, uh, that, that Buds has the reputation of, of being the ultimate grinder. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't have anything to compare it to, but uh, 
I, I can attest it's a kick in the nuts for sure. <laughs> um, well, you, you came and brought a hat and a, and a patch, so I've got a, a parting gift for you as well. I always like the, uh, to, to show the, the one in the box on the camera. Oh, thanks for the coin, brother. Yeah. That's when you know you're the real deal, Mike, is when you is got right? your own coin, brother. Uh, to be fair, anybody can have a coin made, though. So. Oh, my man, that's a yeah. belt buckle right, right there. there. Welcome to Texas. Welcome to Texas. Yeah. Yep, amen. So I, I didn't even have to uh, to win a rodeo to get right. this belt buckle. Well, we're not done yet. So as soon as the cameras are off, <laughs> big boy. Uh, no, man, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come here. Fascinating story. Uh, I've only had one other PJ on here, um, and and it's a question we get asked a lot to have more uh, more PJs and Air Force guys on. So um, fascinating story, man. I, I I love hearing you talk. I could I could ask you a million more questions. Uh, but I know you got a, a flight to catch here. So um, anything that you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah, Mike, I just wanted to say thanks for having me out here, man. Oh, yeah. uh, you're a humble, quiet professional. It's really an honor uh, to be out here in your presence. Your your studio is phenomenal. I know our, uh, our viewers or our listeners can't see everything that's going on here, but uh, Mike's doing really well for himself. And um, just want to say thanks for having me on the show, yeah. brother. No, it's, it's an honor to have you here. I, I appreciate it. Uh, for those of you listening, I hope you enjoyed it. I know I sure did. Uh, great storyteller and, and uh, super charismatic guy. So keep uh, kicking ass doing what you're doing, and I uh, appreciate you coming. Hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, feel free to choke yourself. And until <laughs> next time, this choke is yourself. Mike Drop. Mike Drop.